We are going to continue this morning a study we began just last Sunday. We're going to consider the nature and the reality of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. I think immediately of Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. It says, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The concept of a three and one God is always something that the Israelites had a, a, a difficult time accepting and still still do. But just by that verse, we know that in essence it says, well not in essence, literally it says, Jehovah is Elohim. So he is three in one. We're going to continue to consider the evidences of God. We started this study primarily, or not primarily, but growing out of a discussion about how little we talk about the Holy Spirit. We're familiar with God the Father and the Son and get a little tentative about the Spirit. So we're going to consider the evidence for all three. We considered last week that in our innate innocence, the innocence that we had in the beginning when we were created, in that primitive innocence, in that primitive state, we had the ability to know God. We considered Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. I think it's worthwhile to read that again. To, without any you know, big formal proofs, as men have real, reasoned today, uh, all kinds of arguments, true as they are, about the existence of God without any of that in our original innocence this is what we could understand Psalm 19 verses 1 through 6 the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge there is no speech nor are there words their voice is not heard their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the earth. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, Making wise men simple. I think that's a powerful line. Why, we talked about it last week. What happens as soon as man presumes ourselves to be wise? What happened when I, Adam and Eve chose to take of a fruit that was forbidden and they took knowledge unto themselves? They were, te they were receiving knowledge. They wanted it on their terms, didn't they? And what happened when man became wise? Pardon? <laughs> Sold their foolishness. But we, we talked about it in, in our creation, in our innate simplicity, in our innocence of creation. We had the ability to know God. But as soon as we sought knowledge on our terms, as soon as we get sophisticated, which is, you know, really what people think you know I this is what I've devised this is what I understand the things be. as soon as we get sophisticated what happens to our relationship with God gets, gets gets wider and wider and so we considered last week I had found uh, there are at least 143 arguments in the in the scripture about the the reality of God and and 143 of them are based on what He's done from the beginning of the creation. It, we we see it in in this Psalm as well. That what what would you gather if you knew nothing else from God? What would you gather from the creation and from the first six verses of this Psalm? What do you know about God from that? 
you know that the one who created it all has to be far greater than what he has made. You know the one that has set all those heavenly bodies in their space and upholds that and, and controls the relationship and the interaction of all of that. You know he has to be wiser than all that he has set in place. You know that he has to have more power than we can imagine to not only to create it but to control it. You know that he has set all of that, the sun in its circuit and all the rest in their circuit, according to a, a plan that no man could devise. That's, we can understand that simply, but again, it says when we get wise, what do we think? What do we, we got it figured out. Yes, sir. Well, the thing is, we realize from this that God is perfect. We can't can't grasp that fact. Concept. Yeah, you really can't. So, after the creation, that's a good way to put it, Dan. After the creation, how did he set about to prove his perfection? What did he do? Here it mentions, you know, from the creation itself, there's not a word. Actually, it's the Father's word that made all that. But how did he then reveal that? The word, indeed, in covenant, What did God first do for, for the most, for the least of all people on earth, the most oppressed people on all earth, what did God choose? He chose the least among all people to raise them up, to establish them. And as soon as he had done so, what was their response to all that God had done? Got a little full of themselves, didn't they? they got a little sophisticated is the, the word I'm using. And it's not long, I think it's Exodus 10, it, it, the question comes, how long will you, will you refuse to humble yourself? How long will you, as the psalm says, move yourself from being self-wise to being simple-minded? How, how long will you do that? It, in all that, arg the arguments based on, on God's perfection, based on the creation, Let's continue with this to consider what he's, he's done. He's, in all of that, he's establishing his ethical and his moral superiority to set covenants, isn't he? How does he reveal himself? He, yes, he's perfect, but how is he going to prove that to man? By the word he gives and, yes. And because it is so well ordered and so well functioning, what do you, and, and we have a place, everything he's made has a place and an order. What do you know about that? He, he's, he's revealing his, his ethical and his moral goodness in all of that. And his wisdom to establish covenants. What kind of covenants? I always love this subject. Unilateral covenants, isn't it? Why would God establish a unilateral covenant? Well, Dan, you already answered because he is perfect to do so. But since, since God created us and everything he does affects us, shouldn't we have a say in it, Frank? Should we have a say? <laughs> we have no say. I don't like that, Frank. I don't like that. Since everything he does affects me, you know, sophisticated me, uh, as the world sees themselves. Shouldn't we have a say in that? Yes, sir. I think I thought about what my dad used to say. If you think you do better, do it, then we'll see. <laughs> well, how many in the Bible did think they know better? And what happened every time they thought they knew better? They got dressed down for about five chapters like Job did. But why don't we have a say in the covenant? Because man is not morally and ethically pure. I mean, that's what the covenants prove. He is morally good in the limitlessness of his goodness, ethically good. And even when we are, we're not consistently good, are we? We're not consistent in anything. 
you know, by comparison, man, even in our best frame of mind, even in our purity, we would by comparison still be like unreasoning animals compared to the wisdom of God. And again, if I go back to the, the garden and that one command not to eat of that certain tree, God has proven his moral and his ethical goodness to give that command. It, and yet it seemed right to man to eat what was forbidden. And that is the very definition of what it means to be unreasonable. What seems right to man to do what God forbids is the very essence of being unreasoning animal. And what's the result of that? What Solomon say twice in the Proverbs? There's a way that seems right to a man and its end is destruction. As soon as man determined, I'm going to take knowledge unto myself and I'm going to take it on my own terms and by what I conclude from that, man presumes to take into himself life and to control his own life, to live as he chooses, and the end of it is destruction. Yes, Miles? The one from Proverbs? Proverbs 14, 25, and 16, 12. I think that's right. Sometimes I transpose the number. 14, 12, and 16, 25. Oh, Psalms 19, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. Uh, that's, that's what we would understand tells us what we could understand just in our primitive innocence before we knew anything else. But let's talk, continue to talk about covenants here. What is God revealing in the covenants? What is best for you and for me? And the question is, according to Isaiah 1 and verse 19, Isaiah 1 and verse 19, it says, if you consent and obey, you will eat the best in the land. That's forever true, isn't it? If you consent and obey, they would never have been cast out of the garden. If they consent and obey, they will enter into the promised land. If we consent and obey, we will be those who receive eternal redemption and salvation. But the problem is, you know, we don't like being told what to do, typically. It's, if you go back to that Psalm 19, verse 7, it talks about the need for the wise to become simple. As soon as we get a little full of ourselves, I mean, from the moment that they ate the fruit of that tree, thinking they're wise, mankind has never wanted to be told what to do. And so it is that matter of humbling yourself. Humbling yourself. If you consent and obey, then you receive all the best. By covenant, who, for whom is God doing what's best? Yeah, but, yeah, but, that's horrible language. Yeah, but, God is doing be what's best for his own glory. We were created, why, Dan? Well, yeah, and that, yeah, uh, Isaiah 43 and verse 7, yeah. And, and you can't separate the two, you're doing, yeah. By good works, we're glorifying God. But, God's doing best, what's best for his glory. That, I think we ought to ponder that sometime. I, that raises some eyebrows, I think, with folks. 
that, you know, we could take, in effect, take or leave God's covenant. We can consent to it and obey and receive the best in the land, or we can, but still, God's going to be glorified by it, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of a, a given, you know, give give situation because by us doing what He will, He is glorified, but so are we. Yeah. So yeah. He wants to glorify everyone perfect. with Himself. Because He is perfect. I mean, that's what Jesus prayed for in in John 17. He wants every man to be glorified with Himself and with the Father. All is one. And yet, the terms of that have to be. It's all from God's mind, isn't it? It's, it's not negotiable. And so, in either, either event, as he proves throughout Israel's history, God is going to be glorified whether he exalts the faithful or condemns the righteous. Yeah, really is. And that's, and that's in a sense what I meant. We can take it or leave it because God is doing what is best for his glory. And that's much of the reason of, of the covenants. While they certainly are good for us, again, we don't like being told what to do. And Not really. That would say, if we were thinking that, and we were blasting God, and we were saying, God, you're not going to We don't like being told what to do, but again, that verse in Isaiah, if we just consent and obey, it is what's best for us. So God first revealed himself in creation and then in covenants and through Jesus Christ. Let's go to the New Testament then. John 14 and verse 9. What are people demanding of, of Jesus, of the Son? John 14 in verse 9. Actually, verse 8. Show us the Father. Hey, Philip, you've missed something. He already has. By that time, he already has. He has been. He is the manifestation of the Father. And that's why Jesus dresses him down there a little bit. Have I been with you so long you haven't seen this yet? Show us the Father. God is revealing himself first in creation, then in the deliverance of the least of all people, then in the covenants that he has made, then in sending the Son. It, it continues to, to reveal himself. Peter's just a little late in saying it. Show us the Father. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Kind of reprimands him a little bit because he starts off with, "If you had known me, in other words, you've been with me, but you don't know me. Yep. If you had known me, you would have known the Father. You wouldn't even have to ask." I mean, it's almost like Philip's sort of a spectator. Well, I'm watching what you're doing, but I'm not getting the, you know, what's the purpose of signs and wonders? You're supposed to learn something from that by all that Jesus is doing. Philip, haven't you, haven't you concluded anything from that? He's already shown you. He's already shown you the Father. And Jesus did. The, the way that Jesus lived clearly displayed the Father's personality. Things about his personality, which were told since the days of Moses. How did God describe himself? How did God reveal his personality in the days of Moses, one of my favorite verses is always Exodus 34 and verse 6. It talks about him being full of loving kindness and merciful to generation after generation. Was it, it, was it Philip or Thomas? Uh, here in 14? Uh, Philip. Yep. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. Yeah. 
Yeah, we. Who, isn't that funny? Thomas gets the bad rap all the time. But, yeah, he does. Hey, he's not the only. He's not any different than any anybody else. Sure. Sure. You know, Thomas only wanted to see what the others had already seen. Now he could have accepted their testimony for it, but hey, <laughs> is he? No, he was human. He, he was. He was human. Yeah, yeah. He was human, wrestling to understand what would be extremely hard for anyone to ever understand. We also have the, at the same time, you know, there's in the book of Acts, there's these five references to this Jesus. That always intrigued me. This Jesus. Because there were five or six others proclaiming to be that Jesus. I researched it one time. I found as many as 13 false messiahs who are going about saying, I'm the one. You just follow me and you got it made, Jeff. You're going to be rich if you follow me. You know, you're, you're not going to have to obey all those laws if you follow me. And, and many were following after that. But that's not, those, those others, false messiahs, they don't reveal God the Father. You can't see God the Father in them. The, uh, he, he was wrestling with faith as all people that sometimes wrestle with faith. <laughs> when Jesus reveals the Father, they ask, show us the Father and he's revealing the Father. Look at 1 John 5 and verse 20. What's he revealing about the Father? In 1 John 5 and verse 20. He's talking about the nature of those who have been born of God. But verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. And his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and the eternal life. Where it says he has come, what did he reveal about himself and what did he reveal about the Father? That Jesus had the same attitude towards sinners as God the Father had. That he came and he did all of this, revealing the Father, making him known, setting forth an example of the way we ought to live, because he had the same attitude about sinners as, as his father. And so they're, of course, one in purpose. I think, again, about the people that have trouble seeing God in more than one person or personality. But there it is. Here's the one revealing the Father. Then, of course, the Holy Spirit comes and affirms it as, as well. But the Son has the same nature, the very being. He is the source. He's the, the same essence as God. But again, I, I've mentioned it before, the real problem for, for Jews was it's just inconceivable because of that passage they call the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. The Lord is our God. The Lord our God is one. Literally, it is Jehovah is Elohim. So Jehovah is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 440 times in the Old Testament, the Lord our God is literally Jehovah Elohim. The, the point is, though, 
We were talking about this last week. How that all works, how they interrelate, we don't have to understand how that works. We don't have to know how they work individually and how they work collectively. What do we have to trust? That they are. That they are on what basis are they working? Just as they said, according to the covenant. We, we talked last week about the difference between hope and, or between faith and hope. That faith is, is what we have based on what God has done. Hope is what we are trusting God will do. And all of it is according to what he has said. And so both individually and collectively in their faith and their past working, we're assured of their future. But let's, let's think about it. It's just not Philip and Thomas, but it wasn't enough from, for those either who demanded to see just another miracle. Just one more miracle. Just show me another one and, and we'll, we'll probably believe you next time. What was the answer to that? No. No. Jesus had, Jesus had already shown them the Father. He had already proven his word was the Father's word. His will is the Father's will. One more miracle is not going to change a thing, is it? There, there's nothing else to be learned from one more miracle, or he certainly would have performed one. It had already been affirmed. So God in three persons, all three are crucial to the revelation of the word. How so? The word was from eternity with God, the spirit before the creation. Of course, Jesus is the word made flesh and the Holy Spirit is, is affirming the word. And so it's further revealed then through inspired apostles and, and, and prophets What's the testimony of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2? God has at various times spoken in many ways through many, this is not literally it, but through many prophets and many portions. And all of it works together. There's no disagreement in the way that he has spoken, but there's this continuing revelation. Go back to another verse you know quite well. John 1 and verse 1. I bet most of you know that one right off the top. So don't close it now. Open it back up. <laughs> you know, I mentioned there's at least 143 arguments, that, and they all go back to the creation. John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. Uh, ever how your translation reads, whether it's is or was, it, the uh, past, present, and future tense are the same. It's, it's really without a verb tense there. In the beginning, word, the word, God, the word was. It, it's eternal. And so that's the revelation. Look in John 12. Verse 48 through 50. John 12, verse 48 through 50. I mentioned that verse earlier. Uh, Isaiah 1 and verse 19. Who, he who consents and obeys shall eat the best of the land. Here's the other side of it. John 12, verse 48. Let me start in verse 47. If anyone hears my saying and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And he who rejects me does not receive my sayings. As one who judges him, the word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. I did not speak on my own initiative, 
that the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. And therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. But what's the question? Are you going to consent and obey to that or not? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And we see that the ultimate uh, working of the Trinity with, with, you know, God sent the Son. God took on him what to do. God sent the Son. He passed it on to the apostles. And then when the Holy Spirit came, it brought it to life in real life to the, to the apostles in Acts chapter 2. I was just tying it with what will be included, included in the lesson later. The prophecy of Isaiah says, God says, I will put my spirit upon him. When Jesus comes to earth, he says, I have that spirit upon me. And then the, the, the spirit is, after Jesus ascends, the spirit's going to come as their helper. That takes us to, to uh, let's go to John 16 in verse 7. Speaking about the promise of the Holy Spirit after Jesus' ascension. Verse 7, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Is that a condition? Is there something they have to do for the Holy Spirit to be sent to them? We're just reading the previous passage in John 14. But he who rejects my sayings and does not keep my sayings, will the Holy Spirit come to them? Those who reject the Christ, the Messiah? John 15, verse 22 and 23. Here's the problem. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. Again, you know, people don't naturally like to be told what to do. And if somebody says and says, well, this is what you did. And according to God's word, that is sinful. Well, a lot of people don't like that news. They don't want to hear that. And so if you hate the word, then you at the same time are hating the very nature of Jesus and hating the very nature of his father. And so in chapter 16 and verse 7, that promised Holy Spirit helper, that's not coming to those who reject the word. It's as much to say, really, that there's nothing else that that God can do to those who reject divine revelation, is there? What else can he do? Then, then reveal his nature, prove his nature in the coming of his son, affirm his nature by the Holy Spirit. But if you reject all of that, what else can he do? And so we must receive this. And again, John, or Jesus says in that marvelous prayer in John 17 and verse 8. He just talked about the word given to him was from God in John 17 and verse 8. For the words which you gave me I have given to them. For they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believed that you sent me. Well, those would receive the, the, the Holy Spirit's help. But those who don't, you know, again, if I go back to that Psalm 19, verse 7, unless, unless you'll hear the word and the wise become simple. In other words, the arrogant humble themselves. Really, what else can God do than all that he has said and done? What's, what's the problem? Again, I've talked about the beginning state, our primitive innocence, our, our original simplicity of mind. As we were created, man had the innate ability to know God, but again, think about Adam. 
I don't know how long, whether it was an hour or a day, it might have been an entire season that he might have experienced the harvest of a crop out of, out of the garden. I don't know. But when he took in more knowledge than was good for him, he became worldly wise and spiritually unreasonable. It's an interesting word, unreasonable. The more sophisticated we become in our self-absorption, we push God further and further away. I several times using that, that phrase. I, again, I alluded to it earlier in Exodus 10 and verse 3. How long will you refuse to humble yourself? What can God do for you unless you humble yourself? Not much, can he, Deborah? The first time we find that word humble is there in Exodus 10 and verse 3, but the root of that word is found in Genesis 15 and verse 13. And there it's talking about those people, those who were suffering slavery in Egypt, suffering affliction, that humiliating kind of slavery. They're the, in this whole matter of unreasonable, being unreasonable, there the people were humiliated by oppression. And then God delivers out them out of that oppression as establishes them as a mighty people. But then what won't, won't they do? They won't humble themselves to their deliverer. How unreasonable is that, Jeff? I mean, I mean, here's God. He's, he's done all of this for them. Establish them as a great nation. Delivered them, but then they won't humble themselves to the deliverer. Yes, June. Uh, That last sentence is the real stickler, isn't it? So wise and so proud of their own standards. So wise and so proud of their own standing among men. They would not humble themselves before God. That, that is really is unreasonable. I was looking in the New Testament. We find that that mentioned three different times. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 18. 1 Peter 2 and verse 18. You got it, Jeff? Read it for us, please. First Peter two and eight. eight I may have given you given you the wrong verse. Yet. Yours has unreasonable in it. Uh, I'm not sure which how they translated it there. Which word there will be unreasonable? But it is unreasonable. Even if it's described there in the NIV, that's unreasonable action, not to submit. But I think it's interesting. The original word for unreasonable there is. Scolios. It's our word for scoliosis. What's scoliosis? A severely twisted spine that as it distorts your character, as it distorts your body, what it, it crushes some organs, it breaks others. It, it's a terrible way of slowly dying. But scoliosis is twisted. They have twisted the word and the will of God. That's what's so unreasonable about it. That's when you twist the word in the spirit. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 12, we, we find the word there again, also in Jude. 2 Peter 2 and verse 12, do you, you have unreasonable in that, Dean? Yeah. Yeah. 
that verse marvelously defines itself. Unreasoning is the meaning of that, is reviling where you have no knowledge. The word there is a logos. You know the logos is the word of God. This is a logos, being without a word. They're destitute for lack of the truth. Irrational? Because they, they don't, that's a good definition. They don't have a basis for knowledge. I, the, the point of this is if you don't know God, you really don't know anything, do you? Nothing that's beneficial. In Acts 25 and verse 27 there, we see the root of that word again. My translation in that verse uses the word, it said, it seems absurd. It seems absurd. Well, that's a logos. It, as Dan's translation says, irrational. You don't have anything to base reasoning upon. If you're reasoning like the world, well, that's clearly irrational. And so, in our original innocence, we had that innate ability to know God. We had that inability just to, to certainly be aware that there's this great and awesome God who's bigger than all he's made and wiser and, and more powerful than we could even imagine. We're going to have to wind it up here, but we're going to continue to consider this, that in our original innocence, how we were made in the likeness of God. If you go back to Genesis 1 and verse 24 and following. In our, of our kind, mankind, a kind like God's likeness, something akin to his image. Uh, What, what about us is akin to God, but just not as great as God? Our intelligence is akin to God. I mean, that reasoning ability, it's just not as great as God. We see that our emotional nature is akin to God. Of course, ours is never as consistent and never as well controlled. Man's willpower. That's akin to God's, isn't it? We have a ability to determine what's the difference between our willpower and God's willpower. Ours is never as good as his, is it? Ours is not always used for good. And our, a major difference is our moral sense. It's akin, but certainly not as pure, is it? I mentioned that to begin with. We're not consistently good. I've got my good days. All of you know I've got my bad days. Uh, we're just not ethically and morally pure because we're not consistent. How do we become consistent? We considered it from the beginning of the class. Isaiah 1 and verse 19. If you consent and obey the covenant, You'll eat the best of the land, and why would you eat the best of the land? Why would we be rewarded with the best? Because our nature is becoming like God's nature. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 5, 24, or 28 there. He said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, really, you are to strive to become perfect as your heavenly Father already and always eternally is. That's how you come to eat the best of the land, isn't it? We're never going to be in reality exactly like God, but in this likeness, we're striving to become more like Him. We'll continue to consider that last week, next week. Well, yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Man, I was lucky. Now 
How many times? Yeah, it's a great point. How many times do we, cha we, ch we change the story as we tell it? Uh, it's, uh, it, it's suddenly because you're so skillful a driver or you're whatever else. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. The, uh, that is a great tip. Well, I hope this is good for you. I think it's good just to try to simplify our minds and get back to just a, uh, an original innocence.